You may have one, but it's for 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We just barely got started on it last week. Well, we'll, we'll see if we can make it through question three. Did we get all the way through two? I've just got us marked finishing number one. I've been enjoying this class. Joe needs one back there. I hope you have two. <coughs> you have a question. I can't remember a time when that's happened. If, if it does, it's always the first bell. Because by the second bell, I'm awake, I imagine. Corinth was, uh, the congregation was a mess in a lot of ways, but I'm encouraged by what we read in chapter 8 that we'll get to in just a little bit that shows us it wasn't perhaps as bad as, as at least I thought it might have been. Everybody have a worksheet. Yellow worksheet for chapter 8. All right, let's do this. I, I know we read it last week, but let's refresh our minds by reading it again. I need a reader for 1 through 6. 1 through 6. Uh, Corey, 7 through 9, just three verses, 7, 8, and 9. Boyd? 8 to 12. Now I know we've got a lot of capable readers in here. 8 to 12, 2 Corinthians. You want me to just read the rest of it? <laughs> I can. Okay, Joe. Joe's got it. 13 to 15. I'll give you a dollar. Okay, Sharon. I knew there'd be one. <laughs> That's pretty bad in Bible class. You got to to offer people. <laughs> oh, you're so excited about the money, you can't even remember what you're supposed to read. Was it, <laughs> was it 13 to 15? Have I given anybody else that one? It's 1 to 6, 7 to 9, 8 to 10, 12, 13 to 15. So I think you've got 13 to 15. 16 to 21. Did I, 7 to 9, 8 to 12, no, uh, what am I talking about? 10 to 12, I just can't talk today, 13 to 15 is next, somebody's got to read 13 to 15, in the pain, oh you're 13 to 15, oh yeah you are aren't you, 16 to 21, Two, okay, two dollars. Got a two dollar taker back there. Mike's got sixteen to twenty one and twenty two to twenty four. Who's gonna up the ante? You see, here's Bernice, and she's not even asking for any money. Now there is a saint right there. Twenty two to twenty four, Bernice. All right, good. We're good to go. Uh, I'll pay out after class. What's that? Hold your breath. Yes, I think I got some singles with me. We want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord. And then by the will of God also to us. So we urge Titus, just he, as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you have self in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. Here's 
here's my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean, for I do not mean that others should be raised and you burden, or ease, but you burden, but an equality. That now at this time your abundance may supply your lack, that their abundance may supply uh, your equality, that there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered a little had no lack. That's worth a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thank God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he is coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. And we are sending along with him the brother who is praised for all the churches or by all the churches for his service to the gospel. What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering, which is which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and show our eagerness to help. Uh, down to 21, right? Yes, through 21. Uh, we want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift, for we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. Number one last week, we filled in. Let's go ahead and uh, go back through that. As chapter 8 begins, Paul mentions the churches, churches of Macedonia. He didn't identify them here in chapter 8. He just said there were churches in Macedonia. We do know of at least how many churches? Three. Three. We know of at least three whose existence is noted in Acts verse, chapters 16 and 17. Oh, I gave you that. All right, that's a freebie. Acts 16 and 17, they are blank, blank, and blank. What are those three congregations in Macedonia? Philippi? Did you get that one? Thessalonica? And Berea? Worksheets. Are there any other worksheets? Donnie, where's Donnie? Did you have any extra worksheets? Oh, great. Oh, there they are. They're right up here. He's a delegator. Anybody else need a worksheet? All right, who else? And there goes the roll. Roll's being passed back. All right, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea are the three congregations we know about that were in Macedonia. Number two, chapter 8, verse 2 is filled with seeming contradictions regarding the Macedonian brethren. On one hand, they're suffering a great ordeal of... Affliction? That's, is that what everybody got? Is that what I heard? 
great ordeal of affliction, but on the other hand, they have an abundance of joy. So they're being afflicted, and yet in spite of their affliction, they are filled with joy, or they have an abundance of joy. It was their deep, blank poverty that is said to have overflowed in, their, in the wealth of their liberality. So they're, they're being afflicted, but they have great joy. They're in poverty, but even in their poverty, he says it overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. They, they really gave a lot, even though they were not a prosperous people. And even though they were an afflicted people, they were people who had an abundance of joy. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Which indicates a great deal of affliction. Then they were thrown into the inner prison area with their feet fast and stopped, and they were carrying on the worship service at midnight. Now you put all that together, some of the prayer affliction that goes over nine, or, I mean, seven, five, six, or this morning, uh, we go past 12. It's <laughs> and uh, I'm just thinking of that atmosphere. Right. And then you remember the jailer came in, and the poor son came up. Yeah, his household was baptized in Christ. Out of great affliction, they could enjoy all of the signs. And the grace of God kind of blends things like that. I hope to make the word grace. Yes. And if you go back a little farther in Acts, and, and when the apostles are beaten for the cause of Christ, they, they considered it joy that they were worthy to suffer for the cause of Christ. It really changes your perspective. And when you think about it, when you look at the big picture, the world is totally limited. And this world is coming to an end. So no matter what we have that might be considered great in this world, it's coming to an end. If, on the other hand, we are poor in this world, and yet we have a, a guarantee through Jesus Christ of a hope of eternal life in a world far greater than this one, why would anybody be upset about that? Uh, this world is, is passing. It, if you don't think so, look around at us. I used to be good looking. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm serious. I got pictures. <laughs> you see? <laughs> That's the way things go in this world. But I don't care, because while the outward man is perishing, what's happening to the inward man? He's already said it. Chapter 4, he's being renewed day by day. There's nothing in this world that can renew the inner man. But there's also nothing in this world that can save the outer man. You look at people who are healthy. If you have an excellent uh, workout program and you drink plenty of water and you take all the vitamins and you eat the right amount of carbohydrates and protein, what's going to happen to you in the end? You're going to die. <laughs> They'll just have a good-looking body laying in that casket. <laughs> but you're going to be dead. And then who cares? Yeah, really, who cares? So, so that's what we're looking at here. People who are willing to be joyful because they have the Lord and they have a relationship with Him. It's not dependent upon the things of this world or the extracurriculars of how things are going. Is your car running right? Is your washing machine still working? How, what condition is your house in? Does your roof leak? That's not the stuff. How much is in your bank account? That's not the stuff. It's the things of the kingdom of God. Number three. At least four additional things are noted about the giving of the Macedonians in chapter 8, verses 3 through 5. They gave beyond their 
their means or their ability, one translation has. They gave of their own accord. Nobody forced them to give. They wanted to give. Number three, they, they blanked for the opportunity. They begged, they begged for the opportunity to participate in supporting the saints. I'm not making these words or ideas up. This is coming out of the text. They're begging for the opportunity to participate, to take part in supporting the saints. What, what do we normally see as an opportunity? Normally we don't see the freedom to give as an opportunity. But, but that's what they're saying it as. Because it's an opportunity to give to something that is of the kingdom, that is out of this world. The, the minor investment of this world's currency is, in this context, an investment in the kingdom of God. And it pays eternal dividends. Number four, they did all of the above having first blanked themselves to the Lord. Given themselves to the Lord. If you give yourself to the Lord, he's going to do something with you. And you will benefit from it. That's the way he works all the time. That's always the way he's worked. And then underneath those four, it says this gift of or gracious work was evidently to be gathered and later delivered by blank, according to 8.6. Titus, Titus. So when you see that short letter, three chapters as it's divided now to Titus in the New Testament, think of Titus as the one who was so intimately related to the church at Corinth in the work there with Paul. Number four, regardless of the spiritual troubles of the church in Corinth, Paul writes in 8-7 that they abounded in blank in general. Everything, everything. Now when you, if you're reading this for the first time, this could be a big surprise. Because what have you read about Corinth from 1 Corinthians up through this part of 2 Corinthians. You read about all the troubles, all the issues. They, they got a guy in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians who's uh, suing another member of the church and taking the church's troubles before the courts. They got a guy in chapter 5 who's sleeping with his father's wife and he's Paul's writing to rectify that situation. In chapter 11, they're not even observing the Lord's Supper right. The most, most holy, the most... Opportune time to be reflective on what God has done for us and what we should be doing for others is a time that they were taking to be selfish and concerned only with the things of, of this world and their fleshly satisfactions. They were carnal. They were fleshly in, in verse chapter 3, and they were being divided based on who their favorite preacher was. It, it's really foolish stuff that we read about in 1 Corinthians. And yet, when Paul gets to this point, in this letter, he says, you've abounded in everything. Now, how can all that be so? Hold on to that thought and let's finish this and then come back to that. They abounded in everything in general, but specifically in blank, faith, in utterance, in knowledge, and in all earnestness or diligence or, or application of themselves and in love that those who preach the gospel to them inspired based on their abundance in these areas what did what did Paul encourage them to do excel in the grace of giving in this grace also he says now back to this question how could it be that a congregation who abounded in everything in general and these things in specifics have so many problems and so many issues how can that be so how many of you have children <laughs> do I get to choose <laughs> can I have both of them match set I think that would be a better deal. It's like, it's like puppies. They'll keep themselves occupied if you get two of them. Here. Um, if you have children, you know that with each one, there's something that you'd like to correct if you could, something you'd like to change. 
and duh, how many things are there in yourself that you'd like to change? So if we see it in ourselves, we know we're going to see it in our children. But just because there are things in our children that we think need to be uh, adjusted doesn't mean your kids are bad. And so when we write or when we read what Paul has written to the church at Corinth, well, yeah, there are issues, but it doesn't mean that it's a bad church. Where do we read in any of these letters where the writer said through the Holy Spirit's inspiration, you need to get yourself out of that congregation if you're a faithful Christian? You read that anywhere? The seven churches of Asia. One of them had a woman who they called Jezebel. That's what Jesus called her. She was leading the saints astray. Did Jesus write, all you faithful brethren, get out of that congregation, leave, go somewhere else. Go to the south side church or whatever it is. Didn't say that. Wrote to these churches and said, here's what you need to fix. Here's what's problematic. There were only two churches of those seven that didn't have something that needed to be changed. And they may have. Maybe the Lord just didn't decide to, to mention it right at that point. But at any rate, Corinth is a great congregation. They've got some issues, but they're a great congregation. And here's the evidence of it right here. They abound in everything. And he's talking about everything that's good. But specifically, they abound in faith. They abound in utterance. What's that mean, utterance? What's it mean to utter? To speak. Evidently, they are telling people. The word is spreading through the saints at Corinth about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I would suppose that's what utterance means. I don't think it means they just get around and talk with each other. Some kind of utterance that has to do with the kingdom. In knowledge. They abound in knowledge. They abound in earnestness. This isn't a lightweight issue with them. They're serious about it. And they abound in love. Pretty good congregation. And so now he's writing to them about a new opportunity and that is to give to saints who are in need. And he says, abound in this grace also. Questions, observations, any comments? All right, number five. In chapter eight, verses eight through nine, we read that the apostle did not blank the Corinthians to give. Command. command. He did not command them to give. But was giving them an opportunity to prove the blank of their blank. The sincerity of their love. Here we have it, showing the proof of their love. To make his point, Paul mentions Jesus and says of him that he became blank even though he had been blank. He became poor even though he had been rich. And that through his blank, they could also become blank. Through his poverty, they could become rich. And that through his, oh, read that, uh, Jesus' actions... Oh, and there should be a little apostrophe after Jesus because it's possessive. They are here called grace. Why is that? And how does that, how does that work? What does that mean? What is grace? When you deserve punishment, but punishment is withheld, what's that called? That's called mercy. Mercy. When you get something really good, but you don't deserve what you got that's really good, what's that called? That's called grace. And this is grace. Yes. And that's what we need to do. When our sin's pointed out, we need to make changes. And each of us ought to be the biggest pointer-outer of our own sins to ourselves. How does giving prove sincerity? It's it sacrifice. It comes from the heart. Yes, both those answers are right. Is there more to it than that? Okay, it, it is according to what we have. How does giving prove sincerity? Matthew 
This whole issue of sincerity has to do with, with commitment, dedication. What are we committed to? What are we dedicated to? Are we committed to this world or are we committed to the kingdom of God? And when we're willing to surrender this world's goods for the sake of the kingdom, there is an unmistakable expression of commitment and sincerity to the kingdom. Mike? Well, it, the uh, giving of a, a Christian would be different from a person that buys stock expecting a return on investment or uh, buys a new car to get a, uh, a better uh, mode of transportation or whatever. The giving of the Christian is, is not expecting anything other than a return uh, spiritually. Okay. Doing it because it's right. However, there's, there's something about following through with any teaching of God that we, we know somehow there's going to be a payoff. Now, that might not be our motivation behind giving. When the plates passed this morning for members of this congregation to lay something by in store, as the scripture says, we could look at that, okay, if I give this to God, he's going to give me something back. Well, he is, but is that really the motivation? Or is it more of a motivation, look what God's done for me. I want to somehow express how grateful I am for what he's done for me. And so I'm, I'm making a sacrifice, as Joe mentioned. I'm going to put this in the plate. I'm going to show that I value my participation in the kingdom of God far above my participation in this world. There's, there's a lot to this. It goes very deep. Observations, questions, comments? Anybody got anything? Okay. Uh, number uh, six. Chapter eight, verses 10 through 15. I don't know why I didn't have an underline there, but you can underline that. This begins with the Holy Spirit inspiring Paul to say that he is giving his blank in this matter of giving. Opinion. Opinion. Now think about this. Who's inspiring Paul to write this letter? The Holy Spirit is inspiring Paul to write this letter. So Paul's writing through inspiration. And the Spirit says, okay, Paul, here's a place where it would be good for you to go ahead and express your opinion. But we're going to make sure that we note it as such. So this is, this is very interesting to me that the Spirit of God says, hey, go ahead and give them your opinion. In other words, this is not a command from God, but your opinion must have value, Paul, or I wouldn't let you write it. I wouldn't have you, inspire you, uh, move you to put that in this letter. I just think it's interesting that the way this is working out. His opinion is that it would be to the Corinthians blank to fulfill their plans to give. Be to their advantage. It would be to their advantage to fulfill the plans to give. The desire had previously been present. He now exhorts that the desire be completed. This, if you were here Wednesday night, you know, I had some issues with the way I was wording some questions. But his desire is that they complete this, but I wanted also to get this idea of a readiness. Readiness, because that's in the text. That they had a readiness to fulfill that original desire. This completion was to be done according to their... Anybody get that? According to their ability... And the gift was to be according to what they had and not according to what they did not have. Their gift is intended to ease the... Have I missed something? Did I, have I gone too far? Have I skipped a question? Seems like I'm getting a lot of confused gazes. Their gift is intended to ease the need or the affliction of others rather than to cause the Corinthians to be afflicted. Anything in there you want to discuss or ask about? Yes. 
Okay. Yes. I think it's also good if we keep in mind that God, he never makes things up as he goes along. God had a plan from before the foundation of the world. And so anything that his servants realize, as Paul seems to be doing here, that fits in perfectly with that plan is good. And really that ought to be the way our, our thinking changes. We, we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Go back there, if you will, just for a second. Kind of see how, how this all works, how it flows. 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. What's happening to us? We're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. So as we serve the Lord, what's happening to us? Perhaps without our conscious knowledge of it. We're being transformed. Transformed into what? We're, we're being transformed into a more godly person. We're becoming more like God. We're becoming more like Christ. It only makes sense that we would start having thoughts and ideas that really are knowledge because they fit in with the teachings and the right will of God. Uh, there's another text in, in what Peter wrote about this. And he talked about uh, taking on the divine. And I, I remember just being impressed with this idea. Let's see. I can never remember if it's first or second. I think it's first because I'm not seeing it in second. Is it? Yes, first chapter. That's it, that's it. For by these he's granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Everything in this world has a desire for this world. How, how was Adam made? Made from dirt, made from the dirt of this world. And so Adam's body, your body, my body, our bodies desire the things of this world. We want to sleep when we're tired. We want to eat when we're hungry. We want something to drink when we're thirsty. We, we want all kinds of things but that are of this world based on the body. But our, our intellect, that's from God, knows, okay, there need to be limits to this. I can't eat everything I want to eat. I can't sleep all the time. I can't satisfy my desire for thrill or whatever it is. There are other things that are more important. And so your body has to come under control. And the more we take on the divine nature 
the more we escape being controlled by our own bodies, the corruption that's in the world. When you see people who are addicted, and it doesn't matter what they're addicted to, they are subject to a form of slavery, and it's horrible, whatever it is. That's enslavement. They've lost their freedom. They've given it up. It's tough. But Paul and Peter are writing about a circumstance that helps us to escape the enslavement of this world. All right. I don't quite remember how I got off on that. But there we are. Observations, questions, anything? Number seven. This last portion, looks like we might finish this today, by the way, of chapter 8, verses 16 to 24, begins with Paul pointing out that the earnestness he is encouraging in the Corinthians is in blank. Who else is it in? It's in Titus. And that it was put there by God. Now just reading this and looking at this, we're back to the same idea we were just talking about. Did God force this into Titus? No. Titus opened himself up to it. Lord, what would you have me do? I want to think like you think. I want to act like you act. God says, well, here, Titus, I want you to be concerned about the, the, the church at Corinth. All right, I am. And it's, it's as if perhaps God opened his eyes up to the potential that the saints in Corinth had, and he saw that. And it filled him. Paul wrote that Titus chose on his own to go to blank. Where did Titus choose to go according to the, this text? Well, actually, talking about Corinth itself. He chose to come to Corinth. And that he was sending along a brother whose blank regarding the gospel had spread throughout all the churches. He's sending Titus, but who else is he sending? Some brother. But what is it about this brother that had spread through all the churches? His fame. He was famous. They knew about this guy. This brother was also appointed by the blank to travel with Paul. Appointed by the churches. I heard somebody say it. Somehow the churches communicated their desire for him to travel with Paul and Paul's entourage for the particular work of collecting their gifts. Apparently, his reputation was helping to prevent the administration of the gift from being blanked. And I know there's a lot of context here, but their thinking was, if we get this brother involved in this, it'll help prevent this work with money from being discredited. I just read yesterday, because I've seen these shirts, uh, the Wounded Warrior Project, and I found out yesterday that there's a scandal involving the Wounded Warrior Project. Have you seen those shirts, those garments? It's, got a, one, it's just a, a silhouette of a soldier carrying another soldier. As if the, the other soldier has been wounded and the guy picked him up and he's carrying him and there's this Wounded Warrior Project and they sell garments and uh, you buy the, the clothes and supposedly a portion of what you pay goes to support soldiers who've been injured in combat. And now there's a scandal involving that. Paul is writing and he's telling the church at Corinth, we're sending Titus, you know him, but we're also sending him, this other guy, and everybody knows him, and we're doing this because we want everything to be on the up and up, and we want people to be encouraged that, that this is not something we're trying to do to, to steal some money from you guys. Though this brother is unnamed, it is most likely, and of course, you'd have to read through Luke to know who I'm thinking about here, who do I think it is according to this? Probably Apollos. That's what I think. Luke describes him in Acts 18.24 as being blank, eloquent, and blank, 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 blank. Mighty in the scriptures. Paul refers to Titus as his blank and blank, blank. Partner and fellow worker among the Corinthians. And that the additional brethren that are evidently accompanying him are blanks of the churches. Messengers. 
Messengers, yes. And those kind of situations come up, even though you think they might. And, oh, we'll just be honest about this. Go to Brazil and try to build a church building where you have 14 different people you have to go to for different kinds of permits. And everybody wants a little extra that's not supposed to be on the books. And you say, we're going to be honest. We're not going to do that. And you say, how long it takes you to get a church building put up? It's a great blessing to live in the United States of America where the rule of law prevails, even though it's not perfect here. This is a great place to be. If you don't think so, go to a foreign country and try to do something like that. All right. Last, has that been the second bell or first one? Oh, man. Uh, proof of their love is the last uh, and boasting. Proof of their love and boasting. So, All right. Thank you all for your...